Ну что, начинаем. Добро пожаловать на вторую встречу в рамках темы «Как работает медиация». The Russian language version of the book will be published at the beginning of the next year. The initiative to make the translation and to organize uh, these events is by the Garage Museum of Contemporary Art and the Urals Biennial of Contemporary Art. Representatives of these two institutions will take part in our today's discussion. Before we begin, I would like uh, to remind all of us very quickly what we discussed at the previous meeting and, of course, present our today's speakers too. So, as you probably remember, and as I said already, this workshop was called What Does Art Mediation Do? Both the previous meeting and today's meeting is devoted to this question and i think that this question sounds a bit clumsily and we can open it up to what does mediation do to institutions and to us we focus on the transformation of institutions as potentially one of the key points of art mediation and last week i think we posed a lot of really important questions we discussed what place art mediation takes in the institutional context and how visible this work is really does mediation really lead to transformation can this transformation lead to any social change and what is the role of the broader public in this process do we need to start from the society, imagining the society we want to be part of, and then transform our institutions correspondingly? Our institutions are called social. Does that mean that they already are the space of the collective and the political imagination? And what kind of political subjects do such spaces produce? What is the role and what is the responsibility of mediation? in this imagination and in this production. As I said before, these are just a few questions that we discussed the previous week. The questions that will probably stay with you and with us for many years to come throughout our practice. They can also provoke other questions and new practices, maybe not just mediation and new insights too. The texts that our speakers and you, our participants, prepared for today's meeting think through these questions too. And I will just quickly remind you that our today's goal is to get ready with a Russian language reader on art mediation. We asked our today's guest, Alexander Ivanov, and so that will... Alexander Ivanov, uh, Suzanne, and representatives of the Grash Museum of Contemporary Art and the Euros Biennial to get ready with their texts. So first I will pass the mic to Suzanne, then to Alexander, and I will ask other participants to join the discussion too. Every one of the participants will have three full minutes to present the text that they suggest for the reader. Please enable the audio and the video, I mean the mic and the camera, and share your screen too when you do the presentation itself. Okay, now I want to present our great speakers. Although you, uh, I'm sure, know them already, Suzanne Vondofer, cultural mediator and a teacher with, I think, 30-year experience in museum education. Suzanne made programs for very different categories of visitors. She had it numerous education departments of museums in Germany and Switzerland. Now she works in Liechtenstein Museum. 
It's very important to say that together with Bernadette Seto, the speaker that you know already from the previous meeting, Suzanne was part of Art Mediation and Transformation Study Group. Suzanne, you're most welcome. We are very happy to see you with us here today on Zoom. And that's Dante Ivanov, a cultural professional, my friend, curator. And for five years already, Sasha has been heading the art studio of a cold perspective in Peterhof near St. Petersburg. Alexander is interested in cultural and critical pedagogics, disability studies, and research of inclusion in contemporary Russia. Sasha, I'm very happy to see you too. Suzanne, I'm passing you the mic. Thank you. Okay, does it work? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really, really curious on, on this workshop, on our conversation, and I feel very honored that you um, choose <laughs> to invite me. So I try to share my screen because I perhaps didn't take so many uh, text. Uh, I took a lot of pictures with me. <laughs> Whoops, does it work? Almost. Yes, you see, you. So uh, first picture, um, I have to put you on the other side. So I'm working for in this field for quite a time, you, you mentioned it and um, shows uh, my mother caring, I think. <laughs> and I always thought I, I came from a, a family that, so we didn't go to museums, uh, we didn't have uh, that much art in our family. But on this picture, I discovered at least two pictures and a lot of books. My mother was in an art club and I know my father really uh, liked to take photographs as you see. So a very perhaps um, popular art practice they, they uh, themselves had also. The first museum I worked for was uh, perhaps also not very typical. Um, it was uh, this mobile one, um, which toured through the city of Munich, where I was born and raised. And um, we went to schools, we went to public spaces. And in this museum bus uh, realized uh, exhibitions uh, together with uh, children. So we strolled around. Uh, we were often working on the on on the the places, really the surroundings, the history of the places, and the, the actual life in the places. Um, the children were collected, uh, commentated, asked people, um, did this research work you do that uh, to to do an exhibition? We also landed objects from people, and displayed all of that and also made objects uh, in this old bus. So in a way it was a, um, a museum play and the organization that uh, run these programs called Pädagogische Aktion, so pedagogy, no, I don't try, even try to translate this. Um, they were, uh, they started their work in the 1970s. Um, and so this was then, but in the 19th and, and had a huge cultural educational program in, in the city of Munich and still have, I think so. But then the museum uh, was in this bus and had no house. The next museum I worked for was in fact a, a cultural complex. So it was three museums in an area that called itself art area, or this is more a marketing thing. Um, name of it and it had from old masters to uh, then the opening museum of contemporary art which is the the one with the round thing uh, on top and then uh, i have to move you again then uh, at this museum we had the special situation to uh, have so i was the head of the the education departments but we were not responsible for working with school groups because there was an extra organization for this for this and then we had the strange situation for three years to have an extra building outside so we were in this building which looks small on this picture but in fact was quite big um belonged to a bank it was a so-called public private partnership and it gave us a strange position within the whole organization and um 
institution. We also had to move our offices from where all the other offices um, of curators and uh, all other person working in the museum were and went to this separate space. And it gave us, in a way, I think, freedom, but also uh, from the beginning, it was a bit, um, I always called it a um, um, uh, Luftschloss in German, I don't know in English. So um, something that had no funding in terms of uh, money and workers. So it was a big thing without a big budget. But we did a lot of uh, great um, themes. We, we, we choose to work on themes that were easy to understand for everybody and related uh, to the program of the museum. And one was the theme of movement. And it was related to one exhibition uh, on, um, an, we had an architectural museum also in this complex on um, sports stadiums, architecture. And it was the year of the football um, mastership in Germany. And so we took the theme of movement because we also thought it is, we could relate it to, to a lot of, um, artwork on one hand and uh, things that interested us as well on the other hand. And we did one, for example, lecture series called 3030, where we uh, looked at artworks or other pieces in the museum that had aspects of this theme and then went for a 30 minute walk or run uh, in this area, uh, the so-called um, um, art uh, area where all these um, museums are placed. Um, then as perhaps you have to uh, absolve as mediators uh, too, are these events we had, uh, the open night of the museum. So where lots of people rush into museum and uh, we decided so there also to do um, kind of exercises related to um, an, um, an uh, painting exhibition that uh, took place at that time there. In our separate building where all our workshop and other spaces um, were, we decided to do a action painting light workout um, with groups of people on these. We had open Sundays in, in this house, uh, playing the whole house um, around one uh, our themes. So, and we had the big chance to invite a uh, London-based artist uh, for two weeks to work with us and different groups of the public. And um, it's Lottie Child and uh, she uh, did in London um, activities she calls street training uh, where she uses the, the city of London um, so the, the bank areas uh, on Sundays to do climbing exercises with people that come with her. So, and they're not uh, on, it's not the, the get high enough uh, or very high for climbing. It's, it's about um, using public space differently. So, and that's what she did with the groups of public uh, she worked with at uh, our, from our space out too. And we strolled around uh, this again, uh, places around the museums and between the museums and were looking for ways of movement, ways to use uh, architecture, ways to use public space uh, differently than we are used to. Um, and not as a idea of aggression, but as an idea of um, what does this does to us um, when we, when we uh, confront us with um, the, the barriers that and over cross perhaps the barriers uh, that um, architecture and, and uh, daily life builds around us. So use um, space alternatively. I, I felt we did it with the team too and I felt it was a really um, a feeling of power that uh, you get without being brutal. <laughs> um, and so we worked with very different groups uh, from um, refugees to people who uh, used our public lectures very often, like this lady, and children, school groups uh, from different 
schools and as you see they invented really great uh, movements in the uh, public space we then went always back to our space in this house i showed you before and analyzed and noticed um, these things we collected uh, through the tours and sort of um, um, all the questions of, of risk and what it makes to you and what you get for it and and um, then um, we together published uh, with Lottie Child uh, a little flyer. I, I can also, uh, there are a few I have left. <laughs> so, um, and, and it was then a kind of um, a plan, uh, suggestions for, for every person who gets this flyer to use uh, the spaces around the museum in this uh, different way and we as we were the, the the department who also produced the flyers for the museum so the officials flyers we had the chance to smuggle this uh, into into this so at the palais at our place you got this this plan with with the official program of the museum so um, there is a picture that is uh, not, it's only in my head, <laughs> I didn't find it. And what was very, very special for me uh, in this work at this place with this group of people was really the team. So I never had again uh, a group of people I, um, that was such good in developing things together and daring things uh, but it also um, took us a lot so um, and as well as the building the team doesn't exist anymore in in uh, this museum so I went to uh, Switzerland because uh, my partner is Swiss and um, there was a job um, advertisement for a museum in Lucerne uh, where I live now uh, since 12 years and they started the so-called uh, competence center on art mediation and that was at the time when Carmen was starting also in Zurich and all this uh, let's call it a boom of art mediation took place in Switzerland and so the museum in Lucerne uh, really had big aims and um, wanted to develop their uh, methods and, and practices and thinking of mediation. And we worked together with the local art school and there um, already when I came, there was the, the idea to um, contribute to this research project, uh, art education in uh, art mediation, Kunstvermittlung in German in transformation. So uh, all these questions of transformation Alina mentioned in the beginning. And our pro part project in Lucerne was, uh, we researched on how, so we, we had a space within the gallery, uh, normally an exhibition space we used for mediation and uh, wanted to um, find out how this situation and uh, collaborative practices we did during the time and uh, out and in this space uh, during the time. So it was um, the way it looked like. It, it changed a lot during these, <laughs> these four months. We had it a, a very, for me, very important part was this uh, cupboard with uh, theory and uh, so all the books in there and practical material. And I moved my desk chair um, during these four months from my office to the space. Um, and also was part of the research team that and we uh, first started with uh, methods of like in field work uh, watching and writing what we what we what we saw and writing diaries um, on on what we did in these four months so we did um, rather regular would say um, work in the galleries with with materials from from this space that we then took in the parallel exhibition it was an exhibition on um, 10 years the last 10 years what what the museum had collected then and invited artists and other people also to to um, widen our methods of um, working in the gallery we did interventions um, there was uh, Christian Ratti one artist we in, in invited um, doing a very special uh, tour 
um, with this cleaning intervention um, by one of the students. And um, we also invited uh, educators from other places that there that did workshops with us to to um, again widen our ideas of of mediation and, and practice and also um, with with our team so this was a group of um, from brussels and they do uh, a practice that I, I also very much like to work with with materials and different materials so they really had um for me then strange materials brought into this space we worked with um, as mediators in the gallery space. At the end of um, these four months, we did a display in the space um, where we brought it, brought the, the, uh, make visible all the material that, that um, came together um, during the time to, to have a first analysis and the first idea of how to theorize or how to find the findings perhaps of, of this research process. So, dear, and Suzanne, the, dear Suzanne, I'm sorry to intervene, but I think that we need to make it a bit faster. Okay, how much yes. time is left? Actually, we have around five minutes left and we need to discuss the readings also. Okay. Uh, so maybe if we can fast forward a bit. Thank you so much. And sorry for interrupt interrupting. Yeah. So then I should come to the reading immediately. I am thinking. So uh, very quick. No, I'm, I was almost, almost at the end. So sorry. <laughs> um, OK, skip this project. Um, OK. So perhaps. Um, no, I'm in now at the museum. Uh, I work as I'm strangely in a very similar situation because um, um, we have there a space that is open in one side of the on one side um, to the public space and have now um, the aim to use this space for uh, color collaborative uh, practices. So again, uh, inside the museum situation um, to work um, together with different publics. And um, this is from a workshop uh, we did together. And what is for me different, and that's why I suggest this uh, reading, is uh, that I have to forget every, uh, or, or try to forget a lot of experience that I had before. So I need to unlearn. And uh, I came across this publication of the Casco Inst Art Institute. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, I, I only have it as a PDF. I, I envy you. <laughs> so, um, but I haven't read it through. So. Um, I, what, what interested me in it is, um, so this idea of unlearning and this idea of working together with all branches of the institution. This was, I think, the mistake of the, for me, that I learned of, of the project before. And from, for this actual project I'm working on, we are from director to uh, a guard in a working group now um, to try to uh, do, uh, perhaps something similar um, to engage with, with more, more to in, more intensively engage with, with the public. And what I think what, um, what Annette Kraus and the Casco team refers to for sure is the work of Mirle Lederman Ukeles, an artist I uh, appreciate a lot. And I, um, at the moment, in research of her work, <laughs> um, she did, um, and this is perhaps the cleanings, the most, uh, uh, so the, 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 the nearest picture or so, but I don't know if you know her work as uh, 50 years, uh, life, almost lifelong uh, artist in residence, dance of the New York Sanitary Services. And uh, there are two lectures uh, I recommend also, um, instead of reading, it's a movie <laughs> you could look at where she talks about her work and this is it <laughs> thank you suzanne 
I'm sorry again for interrupting. No problem. But I hope, but I hope that in the end we have time to recap. Good. Uh, the, to recap presentations and also ask questions. I'm sure the participants already have some. Thank you, Sasha. Now is your turn. Welcome. Thank you. And I would also like to thank you as the organizers for inviting me to take part. I'm very happy to take part in this event and especially happy to be discussing mediation with you. I would say that I'm very happy that the book Time for Cultural Mediation is finally being translated into Russian. All the discussions about how we need this translation, how we need to popularize it in our environments. These debates have been going on for a long time and now we are finally coming to get this book in Russian. And I'd like to start by explaining why I was invited, because it might not be obvious what uh, somebody who works at a mental asylum is doing here. Uh, recently, in my CVs, I started identifying myself as a cultural worker. This might sound old-fashioned, almost Soviet style, but in fact, it represents what I'm actually doing, both pros and cons. Among the pros of this kind of job, I can say that I'm lucky that my job doesn't involve hyper-specialization, very narrow specialism. I work at various roles for museums, and this experience of having worked in museums helps me a lot because it helps me to look at the institution and what it does from various perspectives. I am familiar with what PR and marketing departments do for museums because I have worked uh, in such jobs, and these departments have something in common with mediation because they work with specific audiences. I have worked at art education departments at museums, arranging events. For example, when Manifesta 10 was taking place in St. Petersburg, I was working in the education department of the BNL, and I had uh, I was lucky to observe the first mediators who came to us. I was able to witness how this job was basically being born in Russia. I was witnessing masterclasses and workshops and the rhetoric around this new specialism. I have uh, also worked outside of institutions. In the recent years, I have been consulting a lot as a freelance professional. And this is an interesting practice. I have this privilege of not being part of institutional rituals, but rather existing next to them and helping to transform them. And these workshops and consultations and trainings, I have them, I run them not just for cultural institutions, but also for social projects. And this is especially interesting. Last year, one of my cases was an organization that used to create animation for children in cancer hospitals. And they addressed me and said that they would like to go outside of strictly social projects and become a more uh, art-centered organization. And we were discussing this transition with them, what they needed in order to reorganize themselves as an art organization when they're starting from this very complex and interesting practice on the intersection of social initiatives and art. And uh, this was not just uh, their vague wish. In fact, many people working with social issues feel very serious burnout from this. And this organization had it. They 
had worked with this very heavy social issue without being able to showcase their works in another perspectives. And in many cases, animation films that they created with various communities could easily be classified as art on its own merit, artworks, but their status as social project didn't allow uh, people from the art public to look at these works on their merit. And this led them to frustration and burnout. That's why they wanted to create a kind of a hybrid between these social initiatives and purely artistic initiatives. And this is uh, not a very easy experience, but I was privileged to work with them. And my main job for the five recent years has been working in a mental hospital, kind of a problematic institution. I started working there just after I finished my work for Manifesta. And uh, I was motivated in this decision. And I was prepared to take on this responsibility because I was disappointed in the way that cultural institutions work with these uh, vulnerable communities. Despite all the rhetoric, despite all the kind of populist rhetoric, institutions work with vulnerable communities in a rather superficial way. They have short-term initiatives that start and run their course and end, and then the mu museum is not interested in what happens to this community afterwards. I wanted to do it differently. I thought that those forms of collaboration that were provided by museums and galleries were not enough for me to uh, classify myself as a community educator. I decided to switch my perspective to work with a specific community, to work in the field outside of artistic organizations. Uh, I work with artists, a group of female artists who live in a mental hospital, who live permanently in this institution. And uh, talking about mediation, my mediation in this quality is uh, aimed not at cultural objects by themselves, unlike a museum worker who works from the perspective of the museum collection. I'm working with my starting point being in the community, not the collection. I work with particular people and what they create. And my mediation has two components that are important for me. And here I would like to quote one of my previous papers on this. My work at this hospital is to support the cultural autonomy of the artistic studio as a subject of creative work, whose activity is not limited by therapeutic effects or the interests of medical bureaucracy. We are not uh, satisfied with culture in quotation marks. We're talking about the actual reality of art. How do I do this? I do it by problematizing and questioning my own practice and my own uh, figure as uh, a mediator, a curator, and an educator. And uh, this arises from various questions that I'm asking of myself, of my professional community, and the system in which I work. And this could be just usual art sessions, discussions, texts, photographs, projects, both complete projects and imaginary projects. My work can also look like interventions, exhibitions, administrative solutions, or even stay invisible. This is what Jana Grechman thinks, calls thinking with conditions. And in general, I think that a mediator should not have any ready-made pattern or work. It is impossible 
to write you know, a universal textbook, especially if you're a mediator who works with special audiences, as we call them. What you have to know how to do, first of all, is to know how to listen to the people you meet in a specific space. And this is the basic skill for mediators. It may sound very simple, but in practice, this is difficult, believe me. It is difficult because languages that the community speaks and your audience speaks can be similar, but they are very different. People from very different positions and from very different walks of life say sometimes similar things, and it's very important to be ready to understand, to listen to, sometimes to keep silent, sometimes to react and build a practice out of the air. By the way, how did mediation come to Russia? In Manifesto, we were, we were learning about mediation, and at first, uh, the idea was that anybody can be a mediator, an archaeologist or a scientist, a person with any background. We were quite inspired with that back then, but now we understand that it was a populist motto. We think that this somehow deprives us of our professionalism. A mediator, being a mediator is not the job that can be done by anyone. I mean, a professional mediator is somebody who has to be trained. This is my position at least. Even when you're learning uh, to listen to others, this is still a very difficult process for which you need to think, listen, watch, talk to others. This does not happen overnight. And for some reason, we are squeezed in this populism of the venues we work with. Uh, we feel the pressure from the museums that want to become beautiful public spaces and this come and merge puts it they are becoming the spaces that museums never been over their history. What mediation is good for and why it inspired me for so long? When you represent a new job, you have a lot of opportunities and you find yourself in an unstable situation, you're precarious, nobody knows how to sign a contract with you, what your competence is. But actually, you can fill this word with new meanings. And this is what happened here. I know these people, these pioneers, came into mediation and manifesto, immersed themselves in contemporary art, but then turned it into something of their own. For example, Lera Lerner, works in Russia of mediation as an art medium. She challenges the visuality of contemporary art museums, which is defined by specific practices. Next thing I wanted to show are the materials that I suggest for the reader. And this will be another step in me explaining how I understand mediation. Okay, here is my screen. Um, okay, sorry, I will have to exercise my power as a policeman. Well, uh, here are some photos I wanted to share. In this photo, I uh, show the invisibility of cultural labor. It, it is directly related to what I talk about today. New jobs very often, new professions very often are invisible. Here are the books that I want to recommend for our reader. The first one is called a beautiful interview by Gleb Naprenka with Mr. Bigbov, a sociologist, which beautifully reveals the context in which art mediation evolves in Russia. 
a lot is said there about new management, about how old Soviet practices and terms are packed in new creative molds but function precisely the way they used to 30 40 years ago mediation in russia is part of this huge problem i of course would like to recommend uh, the script sorry can you scroll the presentation I think you are talking through the slides, but we can't see the slides changing. No, we can still see the first picture. Uh, for some reason. Uh, here it is, here it is. Yeah, this is the second slide now. This is a lecture by Carmen Mersch in Canada, in which she quite simply explains what was happening in Documenta, which she co-curated. And what is important for me here are two points. The first one, working. with uh, ch child audiences sharing the failed experience. The pedagogical impulse was anti-racist and anti-patriarchal, but uh, the mediators failed to explain to children what Joe Spence art was about, although the work itself raised the questions of the female body image and here she explains why uh, the approach was problematic for me this text is very important of course i'm happy to recommend andrea fraser's book this is um, a collection of interviews and in particular the chapter which is called recorded tour this is her project in the framework of the Whitney Biennial, where she recorded interviews with representatives of different departments of the museum, and she turned it into an audio guide. This guide is, this guide is amazing. You just put on set, and then a dozen of museum professionals start to move you to different rooms as if you're a ping pong ball. As you are part of this performance, you feel how controlled the museum space is, and not only with the different professionals, but also with different personalities. Uh, it includes the director, the head of the educational department, which speak in completely different tones, tone of voice. And I think this is an amazing practical guide. You have to recommend Hansel Sato's text, one of Documenta's curators who worked with the censor in centralism, with the topic of essentialism. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, he uh, introduced himself as a representative of different ethnicities and gave the, the guided tour on their behalf and then tracked how the public reads the perception of race and ethnicity into the perception of works of art. I think this is beautiful performative med mediation, which revealed uh, some mechanisms of how biennials work and also show that purely curatorial approaches are inefficient in the social and political work. This is a performative text, as when you read it with different audiences, a miracle happens. As you can see what happens in the institution as you read this text to them. And this is true, I tried it a few times. Building on that, I would also suggest Tony Morrison's text, uh, which is impossible to avoid. Of course, Tony Morrison is a writer, and in her text, she normally discusses literature, but 
I think when she talks about place, she goes extremely deep. Black Matters is the one I want to recommend, as well as The Remains of Slavery. Sorry, Romancing Slavery. If, as a mediator, you feel that you really want to help the communities, if you want to use the term empowerment, which is quite popular nowadays, most welcome to read a text from uh, the book that uh, Joanna Mulbaron and I published a few years ago, a text by Mikro Sillon, uh, who started introducing the term mediation in Switzerland 20 years ago and a few years ago rejected it as an obsolete one, as an institution, institutionalized practice. practice. I would also recommend this book that you see on the screen now. It was published by Finnish cultural professionals recently. It is about us conceptualizing the labor conditions that we exist in, not just conceptualizing them, but also our taking an action on the situation we find ourselves in. There are a lot of questions asked in this text, including question about mediators finishing their work. If you go home and keep thinking about your work until midnight, can we say that you keep working? There is a when you see a poster here besides the book which raises the same question. And a few more texts. Pablo Elguera, for sure. The text where he very openly speaks about what he had to experience when he worked as an art educator in Guggenheim. He speaks about the cult of famous artists all around the world and how this cult actually replaces participation and engagement. And it, he discusses how it works in the context of museum, a very open and a very transparent and very simply put, highly recommended. And Amanda Kachia, of course, one of the first researchers of disability. She was one of the first researchers to raise the question of museum special museum professionalization and museum activities and inclusion or in other words she speaks about the relationship between an educator and a curator and how these relationships are thought through whether educators are influenced into the work of the curatorial department and she claims that uh, only this thing open to institution up to special audiences, as they're called in the US. And the final text that I want to recommend is Kaya Kaito Wari, Mediation Everywhere. She explains that mediation is everywhere and introduces quite a lot of examples, including children being present in the museum space. If you want to read all this text, please follow our website, Alina Belishkina moderated it too, and you will find all these texts published there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Once again, I'm very sorry Dear speakers, dear participants, that I have to cut you, but hopefully we will fill all of these gaps with our discussion. So now is your time, dear participants. First, I want to pass the mic to those who already shared their text with us. I want you to share your texts, not only with us, the organizer, but also with Iris. Anastasia, I can see that your camera is on. Shall we begin with you? Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Would you like to share your screen?
потому что я mm -hmm. вот. Я надеюсь, сейчас получится. Hopefully I'll manage that. Just a second. Uh, видно? Да, отлично. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, yeah, perfect. I'm sorry, I'm not really an expert in mediation uh, far from all the panelists. I really loved Suzanne's talk and I really loved her sharing her practice, seeing mediation as co-creation when you can invite audience to climb some space areas to fit into smaller spaces by new ways of interacting with the world. I think that art is not on the surface, it's much deeper. This is why I chose these texts. The texts which I think are quite telling. Terry the Deuce in the name of art is the book I want to recommend. Uh, this is especially relevant for mediation in faraway corners of Russia, not in Moscow. As a mediator, I took part in one of the regional exhibitions here at the Ural Biennial Contemporary Art. I was trained with Daria. So it was a crash course, really. My co-students were also very happy about the course. It was very interesting. The fact, the fact is that contemporary art and media should not really reach far away cities and towns. I think we're just getting to know these topics here. And, but I feel a lot of potential. I feel that this could help us engage audiences, bring new audiences in, because normally when audiences come, they look like they are tired already. And this, it is especially sad with contemporary art. Contemporary art is not really widely accepted in our region. The audiences that came used to say that they are really far from these topics and at first they said it was something very alien to them, but then as they were leaving they left with the idea that Contemporary art is not something repulsive. This is just something new. <coughs> and one has to study it more to understand it. I believe that to some extent, as we explore mediation, as we now learn it, borrow it from the West, we also use it to explore meanings. In my experience, I wanted to, people to understand what it is about, but if we just share the meanings, established by the author, we lose some, something very important. Conceptual art says that anything, any piece can be called art, any, any piece can be accompanied with a text that would unravel this piece, unravel the associated meanings with it, but art is much bigger than just meanings. Art is not just about particular senses. Art is not a riddle to be solved. And this meaning is often lost when we just ask the question, what do you think? What do you see here? Uh, a visitor 
would start associating the artwork with some shapes that are familiar to them, trying to find their meaning. And then we can just say that the artist meant this or that, but this would uh, destroy all the immediacy of experience. Our goal is to help people understand uh, what the artwork is about. But if we are explaining too much, we risk over-explaining. And uh, as Suzanne told us, uh, a different approach might be more useful, maybe even a tactile practice, or uh, trying to find uh, elements of the picture or the artwork together that are associated with particular colors, play with the colors, play with their meanings. For example, what emotions are provoked by a certain color? I think this might be the way forward, working not just with hidden meanings and such, but with other more material elements. Thank you. So uh, could you once again list just the authors and the text so that uh, we can translate the names for Suzanne? So number one, Natalia Serkova, The Forbidden Method on Auras and Pornographies of Art, published in 2019. The second text by Natalia Serkova as well, The Song of the First Life, Art versus Meanings and Thierry de Duve in the name of art. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, do you have Ksenia Bolt here? Uh, she was another listener who, sold in, who sent in her suggestions for the reader. Uh, hello. Uh, it was a spontaneous recommendation, actually, because I was not in the main list of members. Uh, I sent in some texts and I told Daria that for me it's more a matter of debate than selecting uh, some kind of a best text on mediation. I suggested that other listeners might have suggested their own texts on uh, forming a community and so on. But my background is in theater. And so I was thinking about the border between immersive or participatory theater and mediation practice. I'd like to tell a little bit about my experience so that this idea gets cleaner. Even before uh, studying mediation, even before seeing the word itself, I had this experience of curating a program in two cities that was dedicated to an exhibition, uh, contemporary artworks based on literary text by Vasily Shokshin, a 20th century writer. And when I was suggested this task, I thought I like tours and I don't like lectures. That's why I wanted to uh, organize all the education events from uh, the dialogue as a starting point, a discussion. And we even made a theater performance in the exhibition. For example, we put chairs in the middle of the hall right under lampshades that were artworks as part of the exhibition. And it was a very interesting effect, people coming to witness the performance and taking part in it because it was participatory, organized as a tea drinking party. And so this was a manifold experience, a theater performance at an exhibition, which was also mediation in a way. And so the book that I have selected, and I have some other considerations in mind, and maybe I'll make an additional selection of texts when we're done today, because I didn't have enough time to select everything that really works here for me. I'd like to thank all the speakers for uh, sharing their selections with us beforehand, because it provokes some interesting answers. But the book that I chose 
uh, is called The White Mirror, Interactive Storytelling and Immersive Theater. It's, book, it's a book shaped like a textbook, in fact, like a handbook, and I took part in its preparation and I worked on its chapter on immersive theater. And in this chapter, uh, the immersive space is discussed and the way to introduce the viewer into the immersive space. And the questions that arose in my mind are the questions of agency of the viewer in mediation and in immersive theater. What's the difference between the two? And secondly, I recommend the story because uh, it's not just uh, due to its, uh, its meanings. My first question is, wh what are the borders? Because these borders are conditional. And my second question is, when we prepare mediation, mediation in the strict sense of the word, we need a structure to follow. And I think that part of the structure, uh, I can say from my experience in mediation, uh, is that I used uh, my experience in immersive theater when I was getting the education in mediation. It's about structuring space because I am always looking at space from the point of view of drama, of theater. But on the other hand, how legitimate is it all? From the point of view of form not being uh, confused with uh, meaning, with function. That's why I'm interested in these discussions. And that's why I chose this book. And I'd like to notice while I was listening to Alexander and his experience, when he was talking about books, I uh, thought about books on social entrepreneurship and fundraising that I had read before. I don't remember the particular authors to share them now, but what was interesting for me is that mediation, in my view, exists at an intersection of various practices. It can include something from social activity, from business uh, activities, moderation, something correlates to its meaning and ideology, something correlates to its form. And that's what interests me. Ksenia, could you repeat the name of the book so that we can translate it for Suzanne and we can also write it down. The White Mirror, Handbook on Interactive Storytelling in Cinema, PR and Immersive uh, Theatre. The authors are Utkin and Pokrovska. Next, Oksana Vinakurova. Oksana, are you with us? The floor is yours and your suggestion. Hello? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to share my screen because I'm not uh, joining you from home, but I hope that uh, everybody can hear me clearly. I'm an independent art mediator, excuse me. Uh, so I don't belong to any institution. And uh, we seem to have lost our connection to Oksana. Uh, I'll try to write her to her. And while she is reconnecting with us, we can give the floor to another listener, to another participant, while I try to contact Oksana and ask her to reconnect. Uh, allow me to fill this gap. Yes, please. Uh, I think Ksenia was correct when she said that the list of uh, sources that we can use could be very diverse and stem from various areas. And this is both beneficial and complicated because we are always recombining and reassembling our reading and define it by ourselves and redefine the field of mediation. And 
I realized that the text that I wanted to recommend today, uh, they were mainly theoretical, but while listening to other speakers, I was uh, picking text after text to correspond to their presentations, to uh, complement what they were suggesting. For example, with Alexander's suggestion, I associated another text that we keep reading. Allow me to share my screen. I think it's familiar to many of you. On the Sigma website and the mediation school, we have this great text by Emily Sitcher and Anna Elfers, where they are considering the term participation and how participation uh, can be defined in various discourses within the museum environment. Participation seen as seen by curators, seen by artists, and seen by art educators. And for me, this text defining participation uh, was uh, very helpful and helped me to uh, define how I work with the audience. They're asking valid questions on various understandings of participation, and they highlight that this is the source of many conflicts in museum activities. And I think these conflicts and contradictions have not been resolved yet. And I think we have all no, recognized this problematic situation. There are several more texts presented on this website, for example, John Falk and his uh, text on museum visitors' motivations and education. I think it's a rather popular text. I have seen it in many, uh, in many publications and many contexts. Uh, you can take a look at the original English text and uh, it's larger than the excepts that are presented here in the Russian translation. John Falk addresses various methods of working with the audience. And uh, he describes how he, he selects museums for visits with various groups and how museum experience is constructed during the visit, uh, which factors influence this experience. And I think the fullest version of this text can be found in this book, Museum Experience Revisited, written by Falk and Dierking in 2013, uh, quite long ago, but I think this book is still relevant, and it has a different perspective. Uh, it uses the idea of lifelong learning and uh, treats interaction practices within museum spaces from this perspective. Uh, I think it's very helpful. And the text that I would like to emphasize the most, finally, as part of museum education, is the paper by George Hine, American psychologist and theorist of education. And in this paper, museum education, he describes the constructivist education model and in my seminars, I use this model a lot. It is quite simple, but very full of meaning. Uh, this is the model, this is the centerpiece of this text, but I recommend reading the paper in full. George Hain suggests taking a look at all educational models, at all approaches to education that uh, are known today and place them within this diagram. It has uh, two main axes that are two main theories, theories of knowledge, epistemology, and theories of learning, uh, psychology. And so all existing educational models can be located along these axes and sorted into four groups, didactic and expository, it is the classical academic model of knowledge transfer. Next, we have stimulus-response approach of behaviorism, 
uh, problem-oriented discovery learning and the constructivist education. And the constructivism model is the defining model in this text. It started its development in the 60s, uh, critical education uh, in books of Ranciere and Frégère. Uh, and of course, the practice of mediation is rooted in the constructivist theory of education. And in order to realize the educational aspects of mediation, we need to realize what the constructivism approach entails. And there is one more text by Hain that I would like to share with you. It's called, or rather, it's dedicated to the definition of the constructivist model and uh, he's asking interesting questions on meaning making within constructivism and the links between meaning making and constructivism within museum education space and to what degree collective and individual meaning making are uh, conscious and to what degree we can provide freedom of meaning making to individuals and groups. I think this, uh, this uh, ties in nicely to what Anastasia has uh, mentioned, the freedom for the viewer to construct their meanings. I'm sorry to say that these texts by Hein are not yet available in Russian, but this is an area of future work for us. We would like to translate them in full and to publish them on the Sigma School of Mediation. I think we'll do it when we're done with the Carmen Mersch publication that we saw today. And one more from me, when I was listening to Ksenia and her experience of using elements of theater, of immersive theater in creating a space for mediation. I just had this particular text open on my screen when she was talking. I'm sorry, this is the wrong window. An interesting book, in my view, by Evgeny Nilov, talking about moderation. And when Ksenia considered mediation through the space of uh, uh, immersive theater, here we see mediation through the tools of psychological workshops and training sessions. And I think that this text and its elements might be useful for us in our later meetings when we'll, we'll be talking about the toolkit that mediators can use. Thank you, Dasha. Thank you very much for your contribution. Oksana, unfortunately, won't be able to join us. However, your text will be included in the red. Maria Klopakova. Oksana recommended author Don to and I completely understand why, because this is one of the texts that I always recommend to mediators, especially those who come from other backgrounds, not arts, not culture studies. If mediators have questions about the nature of art, of contemporary art, I think this is one of the first texts I recommend. It has uh, a lot of questions to the most basic questions, uh, a lot of answers to the most basic questions that audience asked. Well, let's see what Maria Kolpakova recommends. Maria, are you with us? Please join us. Yes, hello. Sorry, I'm uh, connected from a mobile device. I recommended The Art of Seeing by Olson Ward 
Uh, this book was published by the Garage Museum of Contemporary Art in Russia a few years ago. It speaks there about five principles of how one can watch contemporary art for it not to be something repulsive, not to have any prejudices, stereotypes. I work as a mediator myself, project based, and I write my thesis on mediation. So, a lot of books that were recommended, that were suggested today, are the ones that I also read. And Daria Malikova's um, book is also important for me. Thank you very much for what you do. When I read this book, what resonated with me was the idea that one cannot uh, expect to understand contemporary art from scratch pretty much like any other art, like hieroglyphs on ancient Egyptian py pyramids. They're just as distant from us as any contemporary art performance. We need to be careful and caring. Look for new perspectives and new answers all the time. So this is my contribution. Sorry for keeping it short. Thank you very much. And I also saw Nadia Shkinaeva's mm -hmm. message in the chat. You wanted to share a quote, right? So everyone, I spontaneously decided to share a quotation. We can see a quote. At the latest forum, curators forum, I worked as a mediator. This is new experience for me because normally I work as an artist. I work with people with different kinds of disabilities, also on the basis of mental hospital. At some point, I was uh, interested in audio commentary as a way of interacting with the exhibitions. I started working with people seeing uh, visually impaired ones. First of all, it was a kind of an audio walk. Then it was an audio meditation. Then it became an audio mediation. And I suggested that participants took an audio, audio description and use it as the main tool for exploring the exhibition. So blind people were experts, they could listen to the audio description and the same people could learn how to give audio description. And all of this led to the main question for us, the question of communication at some point. We started working in the gallery itself, and what I like, or rather, I still can't let go of this experience, can't forget this experience. Oleg Zichenko joined us, he's blind. He participates in various theatre performances, he does acting, he calls Seva. Listen to all the comments mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. just made. There was a mother with a baby in the exhibition. The child was called Sieva, he was trying to imitate us. There was the Katerina Sokolovska sculpture devoted to anxiety. In the exhibition, anxiety, loneliness. And there were three sculptures too that he took at some cold spaces, cold spaces with massage tables. Anything that caused a lot of anxiety with a Soviet person. At some point, Sieva started to comment on this sculpture. He started describing the sculptures as smiles. He said, he saw positive faces in the exhibition, but everybody started to correct him, saying, Seva, you got it wrong, this is about anxiety. And Oleg, 
of communication uh, mediation. When people start to feel the experience of another human being, Background, как бы, сева, and here, Seva's background for Oleg became more meaningful than a kind of official interpretation or right interpretation. interpretation. Вот, поэтому мне вот такое немножко спонтанное его so высказывание не дает покоя. This is a kind of a spontaneous intervention. I wanted to share it with you, Nadia. So the quote is: "Мне не интересно. Art doesn't matter to me. Да. Oh, no, I'm not Но interested. I don't care about art. I care about you." Я не думаю, что Олег сказал, что мне интересно все искусство, да? Но это была такая ситуация. I don't think he meant he didn't care for it at all. I, I think he said that for him communication was more important than any particular object or any particular exhibition. So he cared about Seva, who suggested his perspective. Thank you. I love this comment. I think this is something that people come for very often. It's much more interesting for them to listen to each other, to um, find out about each other rather than to find out like the official stance, the official position of the curator. I see it very often in my work. There used to be a lot of people who came uh, with this request, you know, tell us the way it is, tell us the right thing or how it actually is. And another thing I wanted to comment on, when I listened to Sasha, you said that there is no ready-made pattern of work. This is true. This is really so. And this is complex work. We always construct meanings together, but at the same time, I always have to work with the problem of evaluating. We need to program projects together with communities and we need to evaluate them somehow. And in the sense, I also look for tools for discussing what it, this could be like. And I wanted to share one of the tools with you. One of the tools that I actually use to design our own evaluation system evaluation of mediators work 2015 are uh, quite a long while ago already text published in the u.s um, by a few organizations it's called a toolkit very instrumental very practical how to engage the community if you look at the table of contents, you will see that it's very detailed how to build a working group, how to build a process, how to be more goal-oriented, step-by-step procedure. Although in every specific case, we need to find a unique approach case-based approach, but still for those of us who don't have a lot of experience, this could be a very useful toolkit for programming your work. Okay, Sasha and Suzanne, would you like to say anything to respond to what has been mentioned? So, I mean, now our participants share their suggestions and I have a feeling, if this is wrong, please correct me, but I have a feeling that there is a need in education, in formal education, like we want to teach, to learn mediation. Well, you, Suzanne, suggested a text on unlearning, not on learning. Do you see any contradiction between learning and unlearning? And what is the point when you realize that you are learned enough and you, it's time to unlearn everything that you learned before? 
So this is a question to Suzanne, and I also have a question for Alexander. What do you think about community building? And Dasha, this, the book that Dasha suggested, what is your take on community building? Okay, Suzanne, the floor is yours. What do you think about learning and unlearning? I'm learning. I think so. Um, I'm very impressed, and I will have a look at uh, a lot of your suggestions. <laughs> Thank you. And um, yeah, I, I, some things I know and, and knew. So, what Sasha, for example, from Documenta and the work of Carmen Merch, this is uh, quite familiar to me. But I think so. What, what I try to describe is that uh, once I came to a point where I had the feeling, so you never get out of the main contradiction. So that uh, the museum, um, the art museum especially, um, is this um, other place, uh, exclusive place. And even if it does collaborative work with, with so-called new audiences, it always, for in my experience, stayed this place apart. So, so there, and and in the mediation field, I always had the feeling we are the the bumper, we are the the the, the, the part of the institution where you have this crash, and um, yeah, and and either I think you accept or or, or always try to to change, but. Um, the, the unlearning or what I found in this book, or I, I, I met one person that was part of the team. Uh, I think she also left, but but um, I, I, I really think you you have to to change the the hierarchies, the understanding in the institution to to really change it, or you find your place uh, within. Um, it, and, and there are enough reasons for me still to to do what I do in these institutions because I I I, I find it worth doing and and really um, want people to to share these experiences and and tr I'm very interested to exchange on 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 contemporary uh, art practices with other people but but I I don't believe anymore that that um, that so we are really um, equal in this processes. <laughs> Это может быть очень теоретический вопрос, но мне кажется, важным его сейчас проговорить. My question could be very theoretical, but I think it's important to discuss it. How do you understand unlearning? What is unlearning? It is hard to translate into Russian even. So, Suzanne, how do you understand unlearning? Uh, I am I still loud? Yes, I am. Um, to get out of what you are used to, so to perhaps also what I described, what I feel within these institutions, I, I have to forget all that to be open, perhaps to do to have another experience, a different experience. And what was I don't know if this helps. Um, what I'm a very practical person, as you saw, <laughs> but what impressed me when when the the colleague of Annette Kraus, who worked with her in in Utrecht, when she uh, introduced us in a workshop, she made an example, and it was that Annette Kraus tried in the Netherlands to work with a group of group of people to unlearn how to ride a bicycle. So can you imagine how to unlearn riding a bicycle if you once know how to ride a bicycle? Or So it takes a lot and perhaps it's impossible. <laughs> and as I feel the, the, I always had the feeling that museums always switch back in this 19th century behavior of being a museum. And, and I wasn't able for me to explain this to myself and perhaps it has something to do with this uh, we think we know how to uh, ride a bicycle and always come back to the way we ride a bicycle. Um, and, and perhaps um, you have to really completely rethink what this 
cultural institution now called museum or art, contemporary art place could be for a community for, for people? I Тут есть вопрос в чате, кстати, про... There is a question in the chat about unlearning too from Daria Malikova. I want to close the topic with it. Well, actually, I thought you wanted to ask this question after I wrote it in the chat. So Dasha's question is, do we need any methods for unlearning? And are there any, you know, is there any methodology for unlearning? I think it's a question to Suzanne, to you, but if anybody else wants to jump in, you're also welcome. It sounds like a paradox, right? It has some inherent contradiction, a methodology for unlearning. Yes, but I'm trying to understand it. And Suzanne has now been talking about riding a bicycle, you know, how can we unlearn that? Can I jump in, if that's okay? Well, you know, un unlearning is like unseeing. It's impossible. You may forget it with time, but you can't consciously unlearn, I believe. So I would rather speak about broadening our skills, bro expanding our toolbox, including some things that uh, we saw as unacceptable. So this is like expanding our worldview, our perspective, and the tools we use in our work. May I also jump in? Ah, sorry, I didn't unmute myself. I'm now thinking that unlearning may be possible in the following manner. And maybe this is what Natalia was trying to say when she was talking about broadening the worldview. I now remember an, a course that we offered in a corporate university. The whole thing there was about making people live uh, the worldview they're used to, train on new roles. They changed their positions and it turned out that from a new role, you start to communicate differently. Daria, by the way, uh, you spoke the same thing. You said the same thing in our mediation, mediation course. When school children come to mediation, they have some roles established in their group. But once mediation begins, this role start to break. I think that professionalism is also a social role that you carry. For example, I have a habit of structuring everything, working with the dramaturgy of the narrative, but I can also find myself in the space where I just won't have enough time uh, to use this skill or I will consciously work without it, work in different roles, Sorry, your sound disappeared. Sorry, I was saying that I also noticed this thing when I personally work with people, people who have almost identical, similar experience, finding themselves in a new uh, surrounding, in a new context. They say, we don't know how to behave here. We don't know what to do. And we need with them to reinvent their own experience return them to the experience they already have in a new context. So I think it could also be a way of unlearning. Maybe we need to change the environment and to try new shoes. Alexander, I still remember about you. I asked you a question. Let's go back to it, if that's okay with you. I will remind you a question. It's about community and community building. We started talking about methodology. What now? Let's switch to community work. What is the methodology for building communities? I think the question of unlearning has links to the question of the community. And in order to answer the question, what unlearning is, 
uh, our vocabulary has another word, hidden curriculum. And when Annette Kraus was working with Dutch school pupils, she used this several times. What is hidden curriculum in a school as an institution, for example? It's what we learn at this institution, at this institution besides its educational agenda. For example, the child is uh, learning to blindly follow the authority, to silence abuse and violence against them, and so on. Uh, many things that are normalized by these institutions. So the hidden curriculum is a mechanism to normalize violence in such institutions. And the child, the human being, starts to look at this violence at something natural, at something that takes place everywhere. And the objective of unlearning is not about building up skills. It's about you uh, not taking destructive things for granted, to stop following mechanisms uh, in these institutions that are destructive, that are anxiety-provoking, that are provoking things that you do want, do not want to have within you. Riding a bicycle is also about the same thing. It's about automatisms, automatic actions that we keep repeating, and we think that it cannot be done otherwise. Cycling is part of the discussion about the body, which is very important, how we physically feel in a space. Annette created things out of chairs with her pupils, which were not possible to sit on, and the children filled the space of the room with their bodies. And Annette said that it's a large room, but only a small bit of the desk is used, where you are sitting straight. What should we do? with the space under the desk, with the space between lockers and uh, bookcases and so on. And talking to children, it's interesting to learn where they hide during recesses or where they hide to be uh, left in peace or where they sit to read. So children in schools are not just learning, but they're looking for spaces where they can find some privacy and safety. And School is full of these personal maps of avoidance from the official agenda. It's very important. So building a community is uh, linked to resistance to community building, because the question is always, who is building the community and what for? So I'm getting tired of everybody saying that a community can be just uh, put together like this. It's impossible, not because it's wrong, but because there will be resistance on behalf of people who do not want it. We're not there to form these communities, to shape them, but rather to look at people to see how they feel and how they actually react to spaces created by us physical spaces, intellectual, emotional spaces, and reaction there too. And our programs empower us to create safe spaces where education is not uh, banked into one, as Paolo Ferreira says. It's not individual fragments put into one's head. No, it's about creating conditions for individuals for them to realize themselves on their own, to do it on their own. Life, we have only one life. Each child only has one life. And we shouldn't substitute their wishes with the wishes of the educator, museum educator, a school educator. The child should feel their own life, their right to live the life as they see fit. And to me, this is the meaning of unlearning. That's why 
I said in the beginning that I'm questioning my own practice all the time. When I ask myself why I behave like this with certain people in certain conditions, uh, this question allows me to identify moments when institution is speaking through me. And unlearning is about uh, listening to this internal voice and separating the institution speaking from me. Uh, Sarah Pierce has this great performance for cultural workers. It's about body, but its main question is why do we, as cultural workers, behave in a conform way in even situations when we are free to act? We choose to conform even when we have variability of action, when we have a choice of action. And it happens quite often. I took part in this performance or workshop and found it about myself as well. Why do we act like this? Why do we not value the choice that we have? Why are we often afraid of making these choices? That's what unlearning is about for me. Communities, there are lots of things written about communities. For example, Benedict Anderson's imaginary communities about the colonial powers slicing the world into bits and creating identities in the Southeast Asia, which didn't used to exist. And what happens there due to this? We all know what happens in Africa after similar processes. I think uh, we don't need to go far with this. It's easy to find texts about it. But non-reflexivity, lack of reflex, lack of reflection is an important aspect here. And uh, finally, uh, an interview that Alina did recently about the Tate Gallery. The Turbin room used to be open, mixing all activities together, children running there and so on. But now this uh, space is being segmented. And the same is true about the life of children. School is trying to segment this. But for a child, what's important is their uh, immersion out of time, because in a game, in play, no such pigeonholes exist. Uh, and the museum creates pigeonholes with the glass walls between them, family room, child room, and so on for this and this and this program. This is not beneficial. This opposes our vision. The question is not about constructing community or my views on constructing communities. The question is, to what extent does the museum architecture influence the community? How does museum architecture construct certain ideas of physicality within us, embodiment within us? How do these glass walls build our embodiment and our sensation of freedom within the cultural space? That's the question for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. In the chat, we're getting interesting comments. And there was a question to you that was asked in the beginning, but I would like to address it to Suzanne as well. The question is, what is the optimal way to teach mediation? How can we teach mediation? Question to you both. Not where, but how? Suzanne, over to you as somebody who must have a more extensive experience here in this area than us all taken together. You must have something to say here, please. When I try to, <laughs> um, I mostly work with students here from art school and, and it's doing and reflecting and rethink and uh, um, I'm missing the English word, uh, shaitan, uh, the doing it wrong <laughs> and feeling that you're doing it wrong. Um, and I do it for quite a long time and always then tell the stories where I felt I did it wrong this time. <laughs> but I think that there are also uh, moments I was successful <laughs> or, or at least a bit also. And, and I think this, um, there are so many layers in, in terms of 
working on the structures, working on the, the real practice. And what I feel in when we teach it here or everywhere I, 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 I had to do with the, the teaching, um, I always felt it was, um, we are now also telling a lot about texts and so, and, and nothing against texts, but, but uh, sometimes then young people come to, to or, or not young, uh, people come and, and have read lots of texts and theories and starting to do uh, still seems very, very difficult for them. <laughs> so how can we, that was something I really loved at the end then in this team and at this place in Munich I was telling about that we had uh, always uh, for three months uh, a person doing a kind of stage or how do you call it, a practicum. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, when I left, um, we, we had, or, or no, there was a party for the five year jubilee and all these persons came and then I saw, wow, they really, I don't want to say that we teach them how to do it right, but they made so many experiences there and, and, and reflected partly with us. So I think it's, it's this doing, rethinking all the time. <laughs> now, Sasha, do you have an idea of an optimal way to teach mediation? In fact, there are various forms. Uh, we have uh, in our practice, for example, mediators who are also artists who are building their practices outside of institutions on the row. On the other hand, we have projects such as the uh, mediation uh, school at the Urals Biennial and the mediation institute at the VAC Foundation that has uh, a program that involves uh, scenic speech and storytelling classes and lots of other things that might get useful here, but they're very different. But what I want to say is that it could be different stories here, but when you start working in mediation, you, you have to start with a position, with a stance, uh, and many people are afraid of taking a stance, but as soon as you get a stance, that you're doing it for something, this stance will determine your program. The attitude of doing everything for everything is not a stance. It's a market story. It's like a supermarket, turning a museum into a supermarket where anyone can buy any experience. But it doesn't work like that. I think for now it's time for us to ask these questions, what we're doing, for whom, not being afraid of narrowing down our scope. We should not think in global megalomaniac categories. Maybe it's better to work with smaller projects, short-term projects, but those that are really topical and highlight real issues. For example, here we have mediation about embodiment or mediation that uh, addresses the hidden agenda of the school. We are working on this story. And so we're working with a certain pool of professionals, including school educators and uh, a very broad diversity of other backgrounds. Mediation now allows itself to build a practice just like you want it. It all depends on your wishes, capabilities, and goals. That's what I can say. Yeah, if I may, although this question was not addressed to me, I think Sasha's uh, answer is very valuable here and Suzanne's answer as well, but I'd like to add one thing that fits well into the constructivist education theory how I see teaching mediation. You are looking at it from the point of view of institution and the mediator's uh, trajectory, but I would like to add the perspective of uh, learning contexts. Mediation is creating an environment in which the learner 
makes senses and meanings for themselves. And uh, so I see my goal as a representative of an institution is in creating this diverse environment for learning with various capabilities, storytelling, community building, oratory, psychology, and so on. And this environment brings uh, in people from various backgrounds, with various experiences, with, who make decisions for themselves. It's like a melting pot in which people interact with each other, with the teacher, with the programs, and enrich each other mutually. When we teach mediators for the Ural Biennial, we never know beforehand their final talk, the, uh, what they finally will present. We're not talking about audiences or focus subjects with them. Uh, we're not talking about the content of the mediation uh, routes beforehand. We build it together uh, through insights, through discussions between the mediators as they are taught. Each time they are taking something from the basic program that I am providing to, that, but to them, but they are rethinking it themselves. Uh, this is a very valid stance. Thank you. Yes, Sasha, you were reading my mind. It is a very valid stance. And the way you describe it, Daria, is very much like our reader that we are now starting to compile. And I hope that in a week we will be ready to share the final shape of this reader with our participants. And I hope that even those who haven't spoken today will share their suggestions with us. Your contributions will be taken into account even if you didn't speak today. Uh, but. I thought that it was similar to our reader because uh, I think that the materials that are going to become part of it are all about different things, uh, about various uh, ways to exist as a mediator. And uh, I think this uh, variability is important and uh, what we get as a result is not just an educational resource. It is something that Sasha called a safe space, a supportive space, where you can find something that resonates with you and helps you to overcome all the difficulties and paradoxes of mediation. Mediation is a paradoxical thing, sometimes unbearable thing. Uh, so, if Anybody would like to share a text that they have selected? We only have five minutes left for this. I hope that somebody else would like to share this. It's a great chance for sharing and hearing feedback from Susan and Sasha. Absolutely. Uh, we're inspired today with our communication. I always welcome to suggest more texts. Can I also share something about unlearning? This is a very interesting problem, I believe. And I think this resonates a lot with our artistic practice. When you come to art, you go through schooling, first of all. When you come to contemporary art, you need to unlearn lots of things. When we speak about unlearning, the question is, can it be spontaneous or should you think it through? This is a question, right, Anastasia? Or is it a comment? It's maybe my thinking aloud, or if you have anything to say, I would be curious. Maybe I can broaden your question a little bit. 
how can we plan the unplanned? How can we plan a transformation that may happen here and now? Political. Uh, can we think through any kind of engagement, including political engagement? How can we mediators plan the unplanned? Is it possible at all? Well, I really like one case which happened in one big Russian museum, which I won't name. For many times, they, for many years now, they've been thinking about establishing a mediation department. And the issue is that the two guiding department and the education department cannot agree about where it should belong. These two museum structures need to learn to work together for mediation to emerge in the institution. They need somehow to rewrite the professional net of the institution. This hasn't happened yet. So this space of meeting of the unplanned, where does it happen really? If even in one and the same institution, two departments cannot agree about anything. Maybe something else comes to my mind. Aksana also suggests an answer. We can plan a framework and participants will fill it with meanings. I love bishops. Chapter on the British museums and the British museology. At some point, there were a lot of conversations about frameworks, but for some reason, no criteria was established. No criteria of evaluating the the programs. I think it is very important for us to discuss how we evaluate the efficiency and the success of what we do. If I do mediation, what is success for me? And you know why it is important? It's important for us not to adopt, adopt somebody else's criteria, for example, the criteria for marketing, like the success is measured by the footfall, by the number of participants. Or very often in Russia, in contemporary mediation, we say the groups will be small, five, six people. For me, it's also a criteria where you checked the number of participants as a criteria of success of our program. But I would say that this question is still open. This is something that we can discuss maybe after our conversation. How it is it to be done? We, as the community of educators, museum educators, how do we understand it? What criteria can we suggest? Something that will be shared by our community, something that we can juxtapose to the existing museum practices that devalue our work. The marketing approach is devaluing. We live in the time of privatization when museums are commercialized and they're forced to make money. Everything is commercialized, including education practices. Very few people agree with it. I think it has to be discussed. Thank you very much for what you have just said. I I just want to express my complete solidarity with what you, Sasha, has just said. And I really feel eager to keep this conversation going. Unfortunately, we have only one minute left. Any final words? Maybe just last remarks from Suzanne or any Odasha or any participant. For us to you know, say goodbye to each other, for it not to sound goodbye, but just a, a new beginning. I think this is not goodbye, because a lot of things that we discussed today will be continued in our next workshop. 
практическую плоскость метода мы будем отвечать на вопросы да и Saturday, and I believe that we will we'll be able to continue this discussion and to keep thinking about the methodology that we use. So I think this is a great kind of beginning for the next discussions. The next meeting will be on the 25th of November. We will discuss what mediators are, what their agency is, I believe that this is a very important question which was already raised uh, in our discussions and we will have two hours to come closer to the answer together with Charlotte Labar and Ksenia Vojko. Thank you very much uh, for today. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Suzanne, thank you ever so much. Hopefully, this is not the last time we see each other. We will keep working on the reader, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Всем спасибо, да, очень интересно, с нетерпением. Хорошего вечера. Спасибо.